G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy and the Eagles Corner for another edition of unpacking a West Coast Eagles performance. It was a very strange kind of game against Essendon where we lose the game by one point and Eagles fans kind of walk away from it in relatively good mood because by contrast, there has been so much better a result than uh, most of the stuff we've copped this year. But on the whole, plenty to like, plenty to be positive about. Um, and in the end, probably, possibly best that we didn't actually win the game. So it's kind of a uh, topsy-turvy contest to start the game really well. I was visiting family down in Kent in England for the day and uh, I actually resigned myself to the fact that I was not gonna see this game, but my body sensed, I think the, my body sensed that there was gonna be an Eagles game. And so at like 5 a.m. I just woke up randomly and I thought, oh, all right, I'm gonna watch the Eagles. Check the score, it's already quarter time, um, and I can see by the score line that two goals, two to one goal, six, suggests that we probably haven't had the better of the play. Essen have certainly left. Plenty of goals on the table, um, and that was kind of a theme for the course of the day. The inaccuracy kind of kept us in the game, but as I'm watching, uh, the, the contest starts to get more and more lopsided. Uh, Essendon's way, they get out to a five goal lead, and you know it starts to resemble more and more of these away games that we've been putting up in recent times, particularly over the last two months. The signs were still better. We weren't getting absolutely rolled, but Essendon were getting rewarded for effort on the scoreboard and uh, yeah obviously our resistance wasn't great in that second term but thankfully in the second half we came to play. One of the biggest positives out of the game is you actually won three out of the four quarters so obviously winning the third quarter narrowly and making a big charge in the fourth quarter and being unlucky not to win it in the end with uh, you know a couple of controversial free kicks I don't think it really matters Essendon were probably the better side but we would have been very worthy winners and we couldn't have said that about too many games this year and out of the three Good performances this year. You got to look at the two wins against GWS um, and then North Melbourne last week. I'd say this ranks in the middle of them. I'd say we actually were more impressive this week than we were against North, uh, but that performance against GWS was probably to a much higher standard, let's be honest. We outscored them two goals to one in the third term. In the final term, we kicked five goals to two, which is really impressive. You know, after a, 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 it would be understandable if we were pretty zapped for energy after a pretty emotional win last week because it had broken a run of about 16 losses in a row. Six day break, track. Travel undermanned as well. Dom Sheed's virtually out for the year. You know, Shannon Hearn's being managed from this game. Shoe is obviously still injured. Like, we're still very, very undermanned. So there was plenty of reason to think we were going to fall away. So to finish the game, five goals to two in the final term is a huge positive. And not only that, I think there's belief more and more in this playing group now. I don't know if it's because we won last week, although, you know, we nearly bottled that in the end. There was a resolve about this team in that final quarter that really suggested, first of all, that they wanted to win. And secondly, it really felt like they believed they could win. But it was a weird game, you know, I think a lot of the more, um, I don't want to say switched on, that sounds patronizing. A lot of the Eagles fans who have an idea of the bigger picture and, and know how much value pick one has this year, I think there was going to be a lot of mixed emotions in this final corner. And I must admit, I felt that myself. So without being around the bush, obviously a win would mean that we're pretty unlikely to win the wooden spoon uh, had we got up against Essendon. Don't get me wrong, I hate the idea of a wooden spoon, but this year, it has to be said, is probably the year where it's most valuable to hold pick one than ever before. It's either going to land you Harley Reid, who everyone's saying is a generational talent. There's two schools of thought. Take Harley Reid and you know, potentially get the next Dustin Martin. Or at the very least, there is going to be an appetite for trading for pick one. And pick one holds immense value if we're going to trade it for potentially three first rounders. So I want my club to be in that position, but equally I want to win games of football. So as we're making that charge in the last quarter, obviously I was pleased for the most part. But when we hit the front, there was a part of me that felt weird. I felt like I was going to be disappointed at either result. And to be honest, that's exactly what happened. I was kind of pleased to see Marek slot that goal, naturally, because it meant we fought back. This team is a lot more character than it did eight weeks ago. But there was a part of me going, oh, damn. But equally, you know, as Essendon got the ball out of the center and kicked a goal uh, to eventually win the game, I equally felt gutted. So it was a weird game, you know, where there's a lot of positives. We're, for the most part, happy about the result. It's kind of like going on a first date to the zoo. It's like, I feel strangely aroused, but I don't know if it's completely appropriate given the bigger picture here. I don't know if that analogy makes sense, but either way, I'm just trying to draw the picture of mixed emotions for football fans in this case. And honestly, I think given the bigger picture, a one point loss and showing great competitive signs, great character, great talent. That's what we're asking for. It's an ideal result, to be honest. I gotta be honest, before we get into the game, I certainly don't think West Coast are tanking, but I, I don't know if I'm the only one who picked up on this, but the body language from Adam Simpson after the game was very interesting. So there's a shot where they're interviewing Merritt at the end of the game. Essendon's just won, kept their season narrowly alive, although you know there's question marks over them considering how much they failed to kind of put us away in this game, but the camera cuts to Adam Simpson walking along and he's laughing and he looks relieved. And then the, he realizes that he's on national television and he tries to turn it into a little bit of a, oh no. And part of me thinks, he's thinking exactly what I'm thinking. 
Thank God we still have pick one. It's not the same as tanking because we're not going out there and deliberately losing games, but I think there's very much of an awareness of how valuable pick one is to West Coast. And at this point, sure, a win would have been great, but the potential trade value of pick one is very, very strong. It has to be said whether we turn it into Harley Reid or we turn it into Dan Kurt and a couple of other first rounders. Now, I don't know. Uh, part of me just thinks West Coast was very prepared to lose that game. But I've got to say, you know, amongst the, the desire to have this pick one, it was a, a pretty, there was a pretty special moment when Marrick kicks that goal. And I'm sure many people have noticed by now, but this kid has been on the list for two months. He's come from Victoria. There's been a bit of talk about, you know, how you're going to keep our Victorian prospects happy because this is such a basket case of a club. And he came right smack bang in the middle of it. I think it was, we'd, we'd just been annihilated by Hawthorne. I think it was his first game was against Adelaide and then his second game was against Sydney. Like some of the worst results in the history of the club. But to see this guy go back and slot a very clutch goal to potentially win the game and he grabs his jumper. And that's a real indication of pride and, and, and love for the team that he's playing for. And I think that meant a lot to Eagles fans at a time like this. I've talked up Ryan Merrick on this channel. I think he's I think he's a really talented player and potentially one of the better mid-season prospects uh, that we've ever seen. Obviously, Jai Newcomb is a, an established AFL gun, but for the most part, you know, it's very, very hit and miss the, the mid-season giraffe. And I look at Ryan Merrick and I think, geez, you belong at AFL level. Not only that, I think he's going to be a very good AFL forward. But the main part of this point was Ryan Merrick loves his club and I love you, Ryan Merrick. Cool, so we'll, we'll pick apart some positive negatives from the game. Uh, I think definitely more positives than negatives. And in terms of the performance that we saw, I'm actually happier with it than I was against North Melbourne because, you know, there was some concerning aspects of the North Melbourne game. But uh, in this one, I'm not going to mark us too harshly and some individuals played really well. Tim Kelly, fantastic game. You know, his, his endeavor and his attack on the footy has been really first class this entire year and, and when he, the difference between his best games and his worst games are uh, is his radar off and you know maybe against North Melbourne it was off I think his percentage of uh, efficiency was about 54 or something in this game it came back in a big way he had 30 touches actually won a lot more outside ball 500 meters gained five clearances but most importantly 80% efficiency and this guy is, is a gun I'm going to keep saying it Jamie Cripps though I think has been there was never going to be one player to, to come in and help us fix our issues but I had this feeling that Jamie Cripps was such an important player that we were missing throughout this year. In particular, a forward half leader that really drives standards in terms of pressure and work rate. And Jamie Cripps, since he's come back into the side, has been fantastic. He had another two goals in this game. Important ones too, that set shot from the boundary line when we were five goals down was kind of the fire starter. Oh God, I just quoted Dwayne Russell. But four tackles as well and clearly has a good rapport with the players out there. And I think our forward half play has gotten so much better with Jamie Cripps in the team. And that's evidenced again, we had 16 tackles inside 50 to just 10 from the opposition and that's the second week in a row where we've had comfortably more tackles inside 50. Witherden was a player that I was kind of happy to let sail into the sunset at the end of this year but I think he's come back in a big way and I think partially that's because we are a more organized team around him. He is a little bit of a one-dimensional player. He's an unaccountable defender let's be honest but when the team's playing well and we've got a bit of a system going we're using the ball on the outside our uncontested play has gone through the roof in recent weeks and he's been a big part of that and he's been able to shine. He had 22 touches, 18 to them kicks and went at 82% efficiency. He's not going to be the sort of guy that you put on Charlie Cameron to shut him down, but he sets up a lot of our forward attacks. And in this, the last couple of weeks where we've gone to a more outside, uncontested sort of style, and it's actually suiting us really well, Witherden has been a key part of that. Jaden Hunt and Tom Cole were also really good. Um, you know, Tom Cole down back. Hunt playing a little bit more of a wing role and driving us inside 50. I thought those guys were really good again. Liam Duggan um, has stepped up and he, he's actually proving to be an okay rotating mid. He's not going to be a full-time midfielder by any stretch, but you know, obviously Dom Sheed misses this game. He spends a lot of time at CBAs. He had five clearances in this game and he's a little bit of a get ball, kick ball kind of midfielder when he's in there. At least that's the way it seems to me. Obviously he normally plays off the halfback, but I actually don't I mind him there as a rotating option, maybe as a seventh or eighth midfielder when, you know, t opposition teams are getting their momentum going. Duggan in the midfield, I actually think has some validity. Whilst also playing a heavy midfield role, he had 700 meters gain, which is the most of any player on the field. I also want to talk about Jack Petrocelli, and he's a player that I nominated in a recent video talking about undervalued players who might uh, be a good trade target for opposition teams, and I really hope he doesn't leave West Coast. But I think what we're seeing here is an evolution of a player who's finally starting to get how to play AFL, and on top of that, I think his core strength is probably the biggest driver of his improvement in recent times. I've seen him fly for some 
good strong overhead marks in recent times. He doesn't get pushed off the ball as easy as he used to when he was just a small, like skinny, small forward wingman when he started playing for us. And you know, there was a really important clearance he won at the end of the game. He's been playing in the midfield uh, in recent times, more so in patches. He had five clearances in this game, I think. Six of his 13 touches came in the third term and he was a real uh, sort of catalyst for us playing well. And in particular, that clearance where he handballs off to, I think it's Cripps who kicks a goal um, to make it about 10 points the margin, I think. He's out of contract. He has never been a lock-in player for our best 22, at least from a fan perspective, but I think giving him another probably a two-year contract at this point, I think is a no-brainer. A couple of other individuals I'll name, uh, you know, Gaff had a big third term. It was a quiet first half, just the six touches, uh, but he had 10 uncontested touches in the third quarter and finished with 23 and had 83% efficiency. Uh, Luke Edwards, you know, it's good to see this guy regain a bit of form. I've always been a bit of a fan. I think he has a future at AFL level. Of that glut of like 21 to 25-year-olds, I think Edwards certainly has a bit more AFL potential potential than say a Xavier O'Neill or a Luke Foley or Zane True or whoever the group of players is. I think there's AFL qualities in there. He had 10 touches in the first term. He had 20 overall and finished with 95% efficiency. So hopefully, hopefully he does enough to earn another contract with the ball still in his court because it could go either way at this point. And Chester as well, you know, he had uh, three clearances in this game and for a guy who was drafted as an outside mid, um, he's winning half his possessions as contested and as uncontested. And he, I think he still got a little bit of the hangover from being a whooping boy at the start of the year he looked pretty out of his depth I think he's coming on well and uh, more experiences is doing him the world of good. In terms of team stats, like I said, 111 marks again is huge. That's a monstrous amount of, uh, in particular, outside ball. I think we had like 43 uncontested marks in the first quarter. I hope I'm not misquoting that, but that is absurd. So yeah, obviously, you know, contested ball hasn't been a strength of ours. Uncontested ball has really, really come on in recent weeks. And that's largely, you know, our ability to control the ball on the outside and get the ball inside 50, even if it's not as quick as we'd like. That has improved and therefore we've improved as a team. And we only had four less inside 50s for the game and 80% efficiency, which startles me because I actually thought this was a pretty low skilled game, but the pressure was high, but 80% disposal efficiency across the whole team. It's very good. If we're going to pick up on some negatives, uh, this is nitpicking. I don't really have any strong conviction about these. Uh, Bailey Williams got slaughtered in the ruck. You know, he's been a really good player. I've talked about him a lot on this channel um, and, you know, against Draper and Phillips, I would have thought, you know, expect him to be at least competitive. He's just nine touches and 12 hit outs, but he's earned a bad game. You know, it's been a fantastic year for Bailey. He's He's also been suspended for a week, which sucks. Um, so I don't know if we'll appeal that. It was a uh, rough conduct, conduct on uh, Redmond, I think. So he's going to miss a week, which sucks. We'll talk about d d derby changes shortly. Uh, Xavier O'Neill having just six touches and he attended nine center bounces. I see some AFL traits there, but I think at this point, if you're getting through in a full AFL game and only touching the ball six times, even if you're playing forward, to me, I think his cards are stamped, unfortunately. Um, I do wonder what would happen if we had played him in the midfield in his entire career up to this point. Um, he'd probably be a better player than he is, but probably one of the first out the door in terms of selection this week. Um, and generally, just brain fades and lack of composure in this game um, probably cost us. And that was certainly true for Essendon. They left so many goals on the on the park. They had, you know, what was it? Uh, it was either Wright, I think it was Wright or Phillips, who almost kicked the ball out in the full from about 15 metres out. But, you know, a couple of brain fades. Uh, you know, Chesser had one himself uh, where he handballed it to no one under pressure. Edwards got caught holding the ball in the middle of the ground. And to be honest, I don't want to nitpick. Those are the two that I remember, but I reckon there was almost every player in the field had a moment they'd like to take back in this game. We've got a big derby next week. Uh, I will be in Canada for it. So uh, be, hopefully I'll get to watch it. I have another time difference will make that awkward, but I'll figure it out. I always do. I've done a pretty good job of keeping up with the Eagles this year. Uh, my passion is as strong as ever, even though we're destined for the wooden spoon. And now I got to say, like I feel... Now that we've seen, you know, continued improvement from the youth and, you know, we can see this this nucleus of Elijah Hewitt, Jinby, Noah Long, Ryan Marrick, uh, just to name a few, suddenly we've got some kids to be excited about. It's making me increasingly comfortable that we could just get Harley Reid and build a really powerful dynamic midfield with Jinby, Hewitt, Cully, Chesser and Harley Reid on top of that. Um, it's exciting. Uh, whereas before I probably would have said we just need to get the most quality youth in and, and a higher number of first round picks would do us some good. Now, I think this isn't actually a terrible place for Harley Reid to come. Um, so there is still a lot longer of this rebuild to go. It's not gonna get worse. I don't believe it's gonna get worse because it's not possible. <laughs> I'm going to title this video, uh, The Dark Days Behind West Coast. And I think they are as far as the embarrassing, humiliating results are. Um, this week, we felt more like a rebuilding team that was playing well. That's the standard we need to keep. And we'll probably be bottom two next year. Absolutely. Finals are not going to come anytime soon. It's going to be a slow build. We're going to get some youth onto the list and develop them as well. But suddenly, you know, this is returning to what West Coast should have been all year. Injuries have played a part. 
you know, I'm not going to repeat myself all over again. It's exciting watching Eagles games again, and I think we're a real shake in the derby. Um, you know, Hearn will probably come in for Rotham. We might get SPS back for O'Neill. Uh, Jamison will probably come in for Williams, and hopefully Shuey probably as the sub comes in as well. But either way, I'm excited. I, I don't know what to hope for in the derby. I'm not going to hope we lose, um, but also I'd feel weird if we won. So if we're going to beat anyone to ruin pick one for us, I'd choose it to be Fremantle. So we'll see what happens. But anyway, guys, let me know in the comments what you think about how West Coast is going at the moment. As always, I welcome your opinions. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.